Hey, I'm Super. Welcome to my meltdown. So, werewolves. There. What? There, wolf. There, castle. Why are you talking that way? I thought you wanted to. No, I don't want to. Suit yourself. I'm easy. Werewolves are at least as old as the Middle Ages. The word itself comes from Middle English. And folklore versions of how one becomes a werewolf range from something as simple as wearing a belt made from a wolf hide to as gross as drinking rainwater from the ground out of a paw print. But I'm mostly here to talk about werewolf movies, which usually go more for you get bitten become one, much like modern zombies and some versions of vampires. Also, occasionally it's an STI, so be safe out there, everyone. Now, I like to be able to sit and get a fresh rewatch of movies I'm going to discuss in these videos, so there are a few possibly notable werewolf flicks that I won't be talking about much because I don't have a copy of them or access to a legal method of watching them right now. Uh, among these are Dog Soldiers, which I remember being pretty great, uh, Brotherhood of the Wolf, which I remember being good and also very French, and the 1994 Jack Nicholson movie, Wolf, which I remember being the only movie I've gone to with someone on a first date and then had her tell me afterwards, and this is a direct quote because it is burned into my brain forever, that I was a cute guy but could stand to lose 20 or 30 pounds. How rude. There were a few werewolf movies in the silent era, but they're not terribly memorable, and most of them are in a not shocking turn of events, lost films due to neglect, studio vault fires, etc. The first universal werewolf movie was 1935's Werewolf of London, which is mostly forgotten at this point, except its title inspired the Warren Zevon, 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 Zevon. I can't ever remember how to pronounce his name, but he made some Werewolves of London and the 1981 film An American Werewolf in London were both inspired by this film. It was also the first of uh, werewolf movies to have an anthropomorphized werewolf. Uh, it also started the trend of a woman who loves the creature distracting it so that it can be killed at the climax, which happens in a lot of these movies. Six years later, Universal decided to try again with werewolves and made The Wolfman starring Lon Chaney Jr., though he was credited in the movie as just Lon Chaney because the studio was hoping people would assume it was his father in it, even though Lon Sr. had died years before. Thought we wouldn't notice. But we did. While there were not direct sequels to The Wolfman, he did appear as part of the so-called Monster Rally films that Universal did, and in every one of those where The Wolfman appeared, he was always played by Lon Chaney Jr. This film describes werewolves as coming out when the autumn moon is bright, and most every entry after that changes it so it's either a full moon or just whenever they feel like changing. Also, one of the first movies to establish a silver bullet or silver weapons as a way to kill a werewolf, but then he gets killed by a silver cane at the end instead, but the seed was planted as far as silver bullets. So, there is an ethnic slur uh, used starting with this movie and throughout a lot of other werewolf movies, and I am not going to say it out loud, but it is on screen here, censored because I need to discuss it, but I don't like to say slurs. Uh, anyway, please stop saying this word for any reason. The not offensive way to refer to them is Romani, as I've been told by friends who are of that heritage. Uh, so I'll be using that instead. Uh, also, there is uh, a form of the slur that is also going to be right down here that's sort of censored. Um, please stop referring to that as someone stealing from you, because that is a form of this slur used to further harmful stereotypes that all Romani people are criminals. So, Romani slurs and stereotypes, the Wolfman has a lot of them. Um, there is a scene where a priest complains to a Romani woman to her face while she's grieving for her dead son in front of his coffin that her ways of grieving are a bunch of superstitious nonsense and compares it with worshipping Satan. Read the room, Father. This is the definition of not the time or place for this. There was a 2010 remake of The Wolfman with Benicio Del Toro and Anthony Hopkins, which straddles an odd line of referencing the original film, but changing a ton of the details, and I'm not sure it succeeds on the same level as some other remakes that I've talked about or seen. 
Um, but it has a character very specifically refute blaming the Romani for what's happening, but that's really just them trying to lampshade the racism in this movie because it makes a point also to uh, point out that Romani are responsible for a lot of crimes, so I can't even give them a gold star for trying. The remake also adds in their own version of real-life actual person Inspector Aberlean of Scotland Yard, though I'm not sure why. Uh, I guess they thought that it would be cool to reference Jack the Ripper and sort of silently imply that maybe Jack the Ripper was a werewolf too. It's certainly a choice that was made. On the bright side, it wasn't from Hell's The Masons Did It, which was the laziest of takes. Uh, I know that the Masons did it and covered it up is a real actual theory of the Jack the Ripper crimes that some people have had, but it is Illuminati nonsense and From Hell is a bad movie. In 1981, there were three major werewolf films that came out within months of each other, and all of them have had some effect on the genre going forward. The first of those was The Howling, directed by Joe Dante, who would go on to direct the Gremlins movies. This movie mostly concerns a news reporter who is attacked while doing a story on a serial rapist and murderer, and suffers from PTSD as a result of being attacked by him and then watching the police gun him down. They don't call it PTSD in the movie because that term was still very new at the time and not as commonly used as it is today, but it's definitely what's going on. She has horrible nightmares, blank spots in her memory, flashbacks, panic attacks, etc. So she goes to this small resort that's suggested by her therapist where he sends his patients to recuperate. But it then turns out that the whole town and her therapist and the serial rapist murderer are werewolves. Also, her husband becomes a werewolf while he's there. He cheats on her. He gaslights her about all of it and physically assaults her and is a, a real asshole. The aforementioned serial killer turns out to be not dead and living in this community because what are the odds? He's played by Robert Picardo, which is jarring to me because he's also the emergency medical hologram on Star Trek Voyager, or as I like to call him, Dr. Hologram. Please state the nature of the medical emergency. This movie isn't really trying to comment on race, but it is commenting on class and the difference between rural towns and big cities, with the entire town is werewolves reveal, as well as maybe not having a high opinion of therapists or therapy. The movie does have a few good comedic moments that genuinely made me laugh, like when a character is investigating in a filing cabinet looking for some evidence, and she finds a folder she wants, and a huge werewolf hand just casually pops into frame to grab it from her. Like, the rest of the scene is tense action horror stuff, but that second of it was so ridiculous that I had to laugh. This movie ends big, with the news anchor escaping, going back to the city and doing a live television broadcast in which she exposes the existence of werewolves, turns into one on the air, and is then shot to death. Then there's an epilogue scene of people watching it in a bar, and half of them don't believe it's real, and half believe it's real, but don't care. There were seven sequels, but only the first one, The Howling 2, Your Sister is a Werewolf, was related directly to the first, and even then, it sort of retcons the ending of the first movie, as nobody seems to remember the broadcast or know that werewolves might be real. As with a lot of horror sequels, the original director was not involved, and it's not well regarded, but a lot of horror fans like it, because it's one of those, this is so bad, you have to see it kind of things. Christopher Lee is in The Howling 2, and when he was casting Gremlins 2 afterward, the first thing he did was go up on set to director Joe Dante and apologize for being in The Howling 2. The next of the 381 films was Wolfen, which I would not seen until I was doing research for this video. Uh, the director, Michael Wadley, was mostly known for documentaries and most well known for the Woodstock documentary in 1969. <laughs> Wolfen was very unlike a lot of his previous work, and after it, he never directed another film, and I could not find anything indicating why. Wolfen sort of trades Romani for Native Americans as the other, but the climax of the movie is essentially a white man acknowledging that we shouldn't have taken their land, at which point the wolves just turn around and leave. 
uh, there's a lot to unpack about the ending of it and the message overall because the Wolfen are probably going to continue killing hobos and the cops don't seem too concerned about that since they only got involved because the wolves were killing rich people. And it literally does dehumanize the indigenous people. But progress on acknowledging that we stole their land, I guess? The wolves are just wolves not anthropomorphized in this. And it's hereditary among a specific bloodline of Native Americans, not transferred by bite or other means. You're either wolfing or you're not. There are some interesting camera tricks used in the movie, like it uses a wolf POV shot throughout the movie that's like an early primitive version of what they later did in Predator, and it's pretty effective for what it is uh, at the time. Uh, also, the score by James Horner is pretty good, though at times it sounds like he lifted a lot of it for his later score for Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. It has a very similar vibe, especially toward the end. The last of the 381 movies is An American Werewolf in London, directed by John Landis, known more for his straight-up comedies. Rick Baker did the effects makeup for this and did an excellent job. Uh, the scene with the dead friend uh, of the main character in the hospital is particularly good. There's a ripped-up throat that has this sort of flappy skin, and it's just kind of juicy. It happened that this was the first year that the Academy Awards had a category for makeup, which he won. Interestingly, he was originally hired to do the makeup for The Howling, but he left the production to make this instead. And I think the effects in both of these movies are great, but his Oscar for this film is very well deserved. Frank Oz has a cameo in American Werewolf in London, and it's weird for me because every time I see Frank Oz in a movie, his regular voice sounds so much like Fozzie Bear to me that I can't not think about it. Uh, hey, your best friend was killed by a bear. Waka, waka, waka. Uh, I'm sorry for my terrible Fozzie Bear impression, truly, but I had to do it anyway. But I'm sorry. The romance subplot of this is hard for me to buy into. Um, the nurse has to put up with what appears to be the most high-maintenance patient she's ever had, who tells her point-blank that he's a werewolf and then she invites him to stay with her after he gets discharged from the hospital. She sleeps with him, and when he tells her that he's a werewolf and is seeing visions of his dead friend, and then rambles about the Wolfman movie and Lon Chaney and says a werewolf can only be killed by someone who loves him, she just reacts to it like, teehee, you're silly. Red flags everywhere. There's this thing after the credits as well, which I'm not sure what's going on here, or if it's a sincere congratulations, or if they're trying to apologize in a roundabout way for a scene in the movie where the main character calls the Queen and Prince Charles a bunch of names, or what. There was a sequel to this movie made in 97, An American Werewolf in Paris, which bombed badly and was nominated for a Worst Sequel Award, which it didn't win, but that's probably only because that was the same year that Speed 2 Cruise Control came out. So 1985's Teen Wolf is a very weird movie. I had seen as a kid but not since then, and it is odd if you attempt to think at all about what is occurring on screen. Like, he turns into a werewolf in the middle of playing a high school basketball game, and everybody adjusts to this completely bizarre turn of events very quickly, and nobody says anything like, this shouldn't be allowed, and also, I'm terrified. I'm not a sports person, but I'm pretty sure the referee would have stopped the game at that point, because it's not in the rule book, but it feels like it should be, that you can't turn into a supernatural creature to gain advantage in a sports ball game. Nobody at all flees in terror. They're all very into it very quickly, cheering on this thing that should be impossible, and also every movie they've ever seen with it involved the wolf eating people. So I feel like at least one person should have been like, oh crap, and run out of the gym screaming. I guess it could be argued that the movie is a metaphor for teenagers feeling like anything different about them will be scorned and mocked, and it's not actually that bad, and nobody is really going to do that to you. But I remember being a teenager. Hold on, let me check, check something here. Yeah, uh, they 1,000% mocked people for being different in high school all the time. Also, I don't think this movie was trying to be that deep, so it's probably not worth that level of analysis. And if it was trying to be that deep, it didn't really succeed at it. 
The first half of the movie maybe could have gone that way, but it is overall a severely cartoony film, and it's very riddled with every 80s teen movie cliche you've ever seen. But it's also been pretty openly stated that this was made because the studio wanted a very quick, very cheap teen comedy. And that's really all there is to it. It's also kind of interesting to note that this was filmed before Back to the Future, but it was released the month after Back to the Future was released and was a giant success. So I think an argument really could be made that some of this film's success was just lucking into having cast Michael J. Fox right before he became the height of his success. Teen Wolf was a success, but honestly, it's really not a very good movie. On the other end of the um, lycanthropy as a metaphor for sexuality and puberty is Ginger Snaps from 2000. It takes things much darker and more seriously with that metaphor. It also has a lot of commentary on girls' teen years specifically and how their sexuality can be seen as threatening to other people, how these formative years can turn friend against friend, and all of that is not probably a topic on which I am the right person to be qualified to discuss. Other than to say that apart from the werewolf stuff in this movie, it feels a lot more grounded than stuff like Teen Wolf does. I feel like these two girls who are the main characters in this are people I knew in high school. I don't think I knew anybody in high school who acted like a character in Teen Wolf. This is also one of the few movies where one can become a werewolf from having sex with a werewolf, so that's a thing that happens. To backtrack a little, I want to talk about uh, Silver Bullet from 1985. Stephen King wrote this script based on his own novella, Cycle of the Werewolf. Um, and it's very weird. It's very 80s. Gary Busey is in this as the main character's uncle, and the first time he appears on screen, he's just casually holding a bottle of wild turkey, which just seems very on-brand. Uh, apparently, Gary Busey ad-libbed an awful lot of his dialogue, and they just kept most of it because they just thought it was funnier. I don't think that that wild turkey bottle was a prop. A very young Corey Haim plays the main character in Silver Bullet. He's a 13-year-old boy who requires a wheelchair. Uh, but it's not just a regular wheelchair. This is a gasoline-powered wheelchair that his uncle built for him. It's total nonsense, but somehow casting Gary Busey for that role makes it more believable and not less. Because Gary Busey is one of the only people I can picture going, Okay, but what if I built a wheelchair for a child, but I strapped something flammable to it? Then again, it also does sound like something that Stephen King would have written and thought was brilliant during his most coked up phase. Also, Corey mentions his uncle is making him a new wheelchair that's, quote, a custom job. Is the gas-powered one you're sitting on not a custom job? Do, do, does Stephen King think all wheelchairs have gas engines? In almost every shot that the werewolf is in, he kind of just looks like a bear who can climb stuff. So, so a bear. The werewolf at one point takes a baseball bat from a guy who had just been hitting him with it and beats him to death with it, and I laughed really hard. Partly because it's very fake looking, it's very low budget. They do the exact same thing several scenes later with the same bat, and I laughed hard again. It's, it's horrible and it looks fake as anything, but I couldn't not laugh. After Corey's best friend is killed by the werewolf, Uncle Gary decides to give him a new rocket-powered wheelchair that's really basically a dirt bike with an engine and three wheels to make him feel better. Your best friend was killed by a werewolf. Here's something that'll cheer you up, a non-street legal motorcycle for a handicapped child. Also, here's a paper sack full of probably illegal fireworks. So, Corey goes off alone into the woods at night to set off fireworks. Cut to a shot of the werewolf watching from the bushes and looking angry. And I'm wondering, is this werewolf just Smokey the Bear? Only you can prevent forest fires. This movie begins with a narration voiceover from Corey's sister's adult self looking back at her childhood. And then it forgets about the narration for a full hour. This is one of those movies where the narration doesn't make much sense as a framing device because the POV character is not present for most of what's going on. But Stephen King loves this narration 
first person framing device so they did it it's very definitely a case of i don't know how to relay this information through dialogue or visuals so slap some voice over on it and sometimes the narration is just telling us the thing happening on screen right then that has already been discussed in dialogue which feels like they're afraid we won't understand the thing being shown to our eyeballs and it ends the movie with a final narration that's abrupt and kind of meaningless narration can be used well but this is not it in 2005 cursed was released and it might have been a prophetic title because it was supposed to be released in 2003 but then it went through multiple reshoots at the insistence of the producers the weinsteins and it's pretty widely acknowledged by the cast and wes craven that these reshoots and studio meddling ruined the movie rick baker was supposed to do the effects for this movie but the producers fired him during production and replaced a lot of it with cgi baker is still credited in the movie even though they didn't use most of his work i can't imagine why they would fire the guy who won the first best makeup oscar for a werewolf movie and replace him with shitty cgi but that happened the various reshoots turned cursed from an r rating to pg-13 and it changed a lot of the story removed characters one of the original scripts is available online if you dig for it, and it's mostly a better uh, film. Friggin' Scott Chachi Bayo having a cameo in this movie is points off. Originally, he was a major part of the third act in the shooting script and ended up having been the werewolf who turned the main characters at the beginning. And that could have been interesting in theory. Uh, Scott Bayo doing it, though, feels like they were trying to lazily duplicate the casting of Henry Winkler in Scream. The difference being that Winkler is self-aware, and his role was a nice subversion of having the cool rebel turn into an authority figure. For more of Winkler, you should really catch the uh, HBO series Barry, which succeeds as a satire of actors in a way that this movie doesn't quite reach. Also, Bayo in anything hasn't much aged well, with his weird shitty politics, Sandy Hook truther support, and the stories about him having molested an underage actress in the 80s and physically assaulting other actors on the set of his TV shows, allegedly. And I mean, even the original version of the script isn't a clever subversion of Bayo because he's a predator, allegedly. But he's also just never been a good actor. And in the final cut of this, where he's just Scott Bayo, enormous tool bag, it's just dull. They could have cut his part entirely and it would have made no difference. Like, why cut 90% of the plot, rewrite the movie completely, ditch a ton of the footage that's already in the can, but keep this meaningless cameo? Anyway, the werewolf curse in this is both hereditary and transmittable, and can also transmit two other animals from humans, as there's a golden retriever in this who gets turned at one point. For a movie that initially was promoted as upending the werewolf genre, it didn't do that. It doesn't really say or do much of anything. Wes Craven was one of my favorite horror filmmakers. He had a sense of how fear works and why, and he was all about the psychology of it. And he was capable of some very wicked satire too, and there's just none of it here. You get a sense that by the time the cast and crew were asked to come back a third time for more rewrites and reshooting, he had just given up. As much as he usually has some larger themes in his films, with this one, I guess sometimes a cigar is just a cigar covered in CGI gore. Craven said very specifically in interviews that he learned making this picture to never do something just for the money and pretty much disowned it. The Harry Potter books and films had werewolf characters, which the author afterwards said were a metaphor for HIV and AIDS. And that's kind of not a great metaphor, since one of them is specifically shown to be trying to spread his disease to as many people as possible, and prefers young children. If it was a metaphor, and not something she thought about afterward, and decided to say was planned all along, as she's done with other aspects of these books, it was a sloppy one that doesn't work and reinforces some very problematic stereotypes. But, as we all know, the author is very vocally transphobic and thinks there's an epidemic of men in dresses trying to sneak into women's restrooms to assault women. Spoiler, there isn't. She is wrong. Trans women are women. Trans men are men. They are not a threat to you. It's interesting that werewolf movies don't tend to have one unifying theme like some genres do, but rather several very disparate ones. 
Movies like The Wolfman go very close to vampire themes of fear of the outsider, fear of the foreigner, of them spreading disease and death, and usually in those films that fear is presented as justified. But there's a whole other subgenre which uses lycanthropy as a metaphor for puberty or sexuality. An American Werewolf in London does that, as do Teen Wolf, the movie. I assume the recent TV series reboot is like that as well, but I have not seen it. The character Oz and his entire arc in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer TV series, uh, the Ginger Snap series, and others. It's hard for me to choose a favorite of werewolf movies because there's so many of them and they are so different. I like a lot of them. Um, but it's just very hard for me to say, oh, this is the one that's, that's my favorite, because I like too many of them. I don't really have um, much of an ending here. I don't have a reason to use the following or a good segue. But anyway, here's Wonderwall. I hope you like this. If you did, you can hit the like button. If you didn't like it, do nothing. If you have a topic or movie you'd like me to analyze to death, let me know in the comments. You can hit subscribe if you want more of this sort of thing. And as always, thanks for coming to my meltdown. Just saying werewolf when it doesn't belong. Why?